So this is uh, Genoa, and Genoa is our latest uh, data center uh, server processor. It's actually 13 chips uh, on one package. At the heart of all the most advanced computers, data centers, and gaming consoles, there are two kinds of processors. You know, we're in a world today where chips are everywhere. They're powering everything. And only one company in the world designs them both at scale. Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD. It's known for computing, but now it's branching out. Its chips are inside Tesla's, the Mars Land Rover, 5G cell towers, and the world's fastest supercomputer. They used to be sort of under the covers. People didn't realize that chips were so important. And I think what the pandemic has done is it just reminded people, and it really highlighted uh, why chips are so enabling to everything that we do. AMD only has major competition from two other companies when it comes to designing the most advanced microprocessors, Intel in CPUs, central processing units, and NVIDIA in GPUs, graphics processing units. While AMD controls far less market share than Intel in CPUs and NVIDIA in GPUs, AMD made history this year when it surpassed Intel's massive market cap for the first time ever. I think AMD is beating Intel on all the metrics that matter, and unless Intel can fix its manufacturing, they will continue to do that. But a decade ago, analysts had a very different outlook on AMD. It was almost a, a joke. For decades, they had these incredible performance problems. They just could not execute. Every product was late or underperformant, and, and that, that's changed. This is the story of AMD, its remarkable comeback, pioneering female CEO, and huge bets on new types of chips in the face of a PC slump, shifting trends, and mounting concerns around China and Taiwan, where all AMD's advanced chips are made. AMD is woven into the origin story of microchips. It was founded in 1969 by eight men, chief among them Jerry Sanders. The famously colorful marketing exec had recently left Fairchild Semiconductor, which shares credit for the invention of the integrated circuit. Jerry Sanders was this big, like larger than life guy. He was a sales, he was a, he was a salesman at his heart, but he was one of the best salesmen that, that, that Silicon Valley had ever seen. Stories of like lavish parties that they would throw. And I think there's one story about him and his wife like coming down the stairs at the, at, the, at the party and like matching like fur coats. Jerry Sanders at the time, a lot of his philosophy was, was kind of new, novel. Things like um, uh, bonuses and profit sharing, those were not just for the executives. AMD released its first product in 1970, went public in 1972, and was pumping out computer chips by the mid-70s. It was a second source supplier for Intel by the 80s, when Harry Levinson began his 20 plus years with AMD. When I first got there, it, most people didn't know about semiconductor devices. In the mid 80s, AMD and Intel parted ways. And by the late 80s and early 90s, AMD reverse engineered Intel's chips to make its own products that were compatible with Intel's groundbreaking x86 software, making PC pricing more competitive for end consumers. When we really got going in the x86, there was a revolution. AMD and Intel entered a long legal battle over the intellectual rights to the x86 processor. It culminated in a settlement in 1995 after the California Supreme Court ruled in favor of AMD's right to design x86 chips. From there, AMD became a major player in semis, raising Intel to become first to produce a 1 GHz processor and making the first 1 teraflop GPU, meaning it can handle a trillion calculations every second. For almost all its 53 years, AMD has been designing chips for computers, data centers, and gaming consoles like the PS5 and latest Xbox. But under CEO Lisa Su, it's branched out into whole new sectors. We're in the um, Tesla models uh, S and X. We're also um, in many industrial applications, aerospace and defense applications, healthcare applications. Until just over a decade ago, AMD wasn't just designing these chips, it was making them too. Jerry Sanders is very famous for saying, real men have fabs, which obviously is a comment that is problematic on a number of levels, and I think has largely been disproven by history. That's because as the technology advances, making chips has gotten prohibitively expensive. It now takes billions of dollars and several years to build a chip fab. And eventually it, it proved too much. And you know when the financial crisis hit like 08, 09, AMD almost went bankrupt. In 2006, AMD bought major fabless chip company ATI for 5.4 billion. Then in 2009, AMD broke off its manufacturing arm altogether, forming global foundries. That's when their, their execution really started to take off because they no longer had to worry about the foundry side of things. Global Foundries went public in 2021 and remains a top maker of the less advanced chips found in simpler components like a car's anti-lock brakes or heads-up display. But it stopped making leading edge chips in 2018. 
unfortunately, the execution was not sufficient at, at Global Foundries for that relationship to be sustained. Instead, AMD turned to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, the first chip company to focus entirely on manufacturing. Today, TSMC manufactures at least 90% of the world's most advanced chips and all of AMD's. When you think about uh, what do you need to do to be world-class in design, it's a certain set of skills. And then what do you need to do to be world-class in manufacturing, it's a different set of skills. And you know the uh, business model is different, uh, the capital uh, model is different. By breaking away from manufacturing, AMD suddenly had far less capital expenditure. Making chips has gotten so expensive because of how precise the process is, now that the smallest transistors are 10,000 times thinner than a human hair. To make leading-edge chips 7 nanometer and better requires an advanced form of lithography called EUV. Think of it like extreme precision etching, done with a beam of extreme ultraviolet light by a machine that costs $200 million, made by ASML in the Netherlands. We are the only provider on the planet of this critical technology. TSMC was the first to deliver high-volume chips made with ASML's EUV machines, and that's kept it at the front of the pack. But now Intel's doubled down on manufacturing, producing its first chips with EUV this year, and committing $20 billion for new fabs in Arizona and up to $100 billion in Ohio, for what it says will be the world's largest chip-making complex. But the projects are still years away from coming online. Intel is just not moving forward fast enough. They've said they expect to continue to lose share next year, and I think we'll see that on the client side. And that's helped out AMD tremendously on the data center side. Many point to AMD's Zen line of CPUs, first released in 2017, as the moment AMD started to catch Intel. This is a little hard, I'm sure, to choose among your babies, but do you have a favorite product? That's very hard, but if I had to choose a product or you know, something that was really transformational for the company, I would say our first Zen processor. I mean, they were like literally like it was probably six months away from the edge, and somehow they pulled out of it. I mean, they, they have this Hail Mary on this new product design. They're still selling like later generations of today. They call it Zen and it, it worked. It had a massively improved performance. It enabled them to stem the share losses and ultimately turn them around. Among the Zen products, AMD's epic family of CPUs have made monumental leaps on the data center side. Its latest, Genoa, was released earlier this month. AMD's data center customers include Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft Azure. And what it does is it's a very, very high performance uh, capability that uh, goes into, you know, think about it in cloud servers or you know, in your enterprise backend. AMD's success at catching up to Intel's technological advances is something many attribute to Lisa Su, who took over as CEO in 2014. When I started as CEO, we were probably about 8,000 uh, people. And uh, this year we're about 25,000. So we have a few more people than we used to. Sue is the first female CEO of a major semiconductor company. She was Fortune's number two business person of the year in 2020 and the recipient of three of the semi-industry's top honors. Sue also serves on President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, which pushed hard for the recent passage of the CHIPS Act. It sets aside $52 billion for U.S. companies to manufacture chips domestically instead of overseas. I was you know, honored enough to actually be at the signing ceremony. And when you think about you know, sort of the Chips and Science Act overall, I think it's a recognition of just how important semiconductors are to both you know, sort of the um, economic prosperity as well as national security in the United States. With all of the world's most advanced semiconductors currently made in Asia, the chip shortage highlighted the problems of overseas dependency. And then there's the continued tension between China and Taiwan. I think we are all vulnerable to semiconductor supply chains reliance on TSMC. If we get to the point where TSMC is cut off, if we are cut off from TSMC, we, we all have bigger problems to worry about than getting the latest graphics cards. So now TSMC is building a $12 billion 5 nanometer chip fab outside Phoenix. We're pleased with the expansion in Arizona. We think that's a great thing and we'd like to see it expand even more. And earlier this month, the Biden administration enacted big new bans on semiconductor exports to China. China has become more aggressive in what they call their military civil fusion strategy, which is essentially fancy talk for buying our sophisticated chips, which is supposedly for commercial purposes, and putting them into military equipment to advance their military. AMD has about 3,000 employees in China, and 25% of its sales were to China last year. 
And when we look at the most recent regulations, um, you know, they're not significantly impacting our business. It does affect some of our highest end chips that are used in you know, sort of AI applications, and we were not selling those um, into China. So overall, I would say the revenue impact has been very small. Something that is impacting AMD's revenue, at least for now, is the PC slump. During the pandemic, every, we pulled demand forward. People just up, at home, and so we all upgraded our computers and our, all our gear. And now nobody's doing that again. We're all going back to work and using work computers, and we're not buying new ones at, at the same pace. And so we're just correcting for that. In Q3 earnings reported earlier this month, AMD missed expectations, shortly after Intel warned of a soft fourth quarter coming up. PC shipments were down nearly 20% in Q3, the steepest decline in more than 20 years. It's down, which might have been as expected, but it's down a bit more than uh, perhaps uh, we expected. There is a cycle of you know, correction, uh, which um, you know, happens from time to time, but we're very focused on the long-term roadmap. And it's not just PC sales that are slowing. Many say the very core of computer chip technology advancement is slowing down. An industry rule called Moore's Law used to dictate that the number of resistors on a chip would double about every two years. The process that we call Moore's Law still has at least another decade to go, but there's definitely, it's slowing down. Everybody sort of used CPUs for everything, just general purpose compute, but that's all slowed down. And so now it suddenly makes sense to do more customized solutions. That's why in February, AMD closed on one of the biggest acquisitions in semiconductor history, 49 billion for Xilinx, known for its reprogrammable adaptive chips called field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. FPGAs are in robotics. They're in, you know, wireless base stations that place your cell phone. They're in cars and in smart cameras. They're in the Mars uh, Land Rover, the Perseverance. We're in satellites in space. We're in avionics. We're in medical systems, uh, robotic surgery. We're in agricultural equipment. So very, very diverse. Former Xilinx CEO Victor Pang has been in the silicon industry for 40 years, including two stints at AMD, where he now runs embedded computing. So this is for creating a very smart camera. It can be changed in the hardware perspective. It could also be changed from software because it's, it's got both. An estimated 20% of AMD's revenue in 2022 will come from FPGAs, with 72% from CPUs and 8% from GPUs. AMD is also king in gaming processors, while Intel controls more than 70% of the CPU market and Nvidia controls 87% of GPUs. It's AMD that designs 83% of gaming console processors. And as more and more changes come to the semiconductor industry, Sue says it's all about being willing to reassess. If you looked at our business uh, five years ago, we were probably you know, more than you know, 80, 90 percent in the consumer markets and you know, very PC centric and gaming centric. And as I thought about what the, we wanted for the strategy of the company, we believed that you know, for high performance computing, uh, really the data center was the most strategic piece of the business. Earlier this year, AMD acquired data center optimization startup Pensando for $1.9 billion. I mean, we can quibble about some of the prices they paid for some of these things and what the returns will look like. But building a custom compute business to help their customers design their own chips. It's a, it's a smart strategy. That's because more and more big companies are designing specialized chips just for their purposes. Amazon has its own Graviton processors for AWS. Google designs its own AI chips for the Pixel phone and a specific video chip for YouTube. Even John Deere is coming out with its own chips for autonomous tractors. How does it feel to have some of your customers become competitors in a sense? Well, if you really look underneath you know, what's happening in the chip industry over the last you know, five years is everybody needs more chips. And, and you see them everywhere, right? Particularly the growth of the cloud has been such a, a key trend over the last five years. And what that means is you know, when you have very high volume growth in chips, you do want to do more customization. Even basic chip architecture is at a transition point. AMD and Intel chips are based on the five decade old x86 architecture. Now ARM architecture chips are growing in popularity, with companies like Nvidia and Ampere making major promises about developing ARM CPUs, and Apple switching from Intel to self-designed ARM processors. My view is uh, it's really not a debate between x86 and ARM. You're, you're going to see, uh, you know, basically these two are the most important architectures you know, out there in the market. And what, um, what we've seen is it's really about what you do with the compute. For now, AMD continues to advance its x86 core computing chips while diversifying to meet the needs of the ever-shifting and vulnerable business of advanced semiconductors.
you really have to make big bets and you know, kind of see the future, what's going to happen over the next three to five years, what are the things that are going to change, and then how do we uniquely capture those opportunities to bring technology that nobody else could do to the market.